What a blessing it is to be with you tonight. Everybody, as you're joining in, of course, you could uh, share this broadcast and um, share this broadcast to your page as we are dealing with some amazing things on here um, tonight. These are very important times, and as you can see, a lot of a lot of things that the Holy Spirit is bringing past to your life is coming to you in uncommon ways. I want you to think about this. God has uncommon ways in which the promise travels to you. I want you to think about this because it's so amazing when you when you really uh, take time to meditate. God has uncommon ways in which his promises come to you. If you remember what happened with Sarah, Sarah saw the promise coming through Hagar. That was all her brain could imagine. But the promise was not coming through that expectation. It was actually coming through her going through the ups and downs of pregnancy, going through the discomfort in her bones. Remember, she was an older woman, so she had to feel fatigue at that age she was at. Just think about that. Her promise was coming through a way where she was suffering. This is so profound what I'm telling you. Sarah saw Isaac through an easier route. Hagar was a scapegoat. Hagar is younger, more flexible, more youthful, more convenient. But that's not the way that God has chosen to get the promise to Sarah. Oftentimes, there is a segment in everybody's brain that plays out the scenes of how your promise will show up. Expectation needs adaptation. Expectation needs adaptation. Because what you expect arouses your emotions. And if what you expect doesn't happen according to your expectation, it yields bitterness. Expectation needs adaptation because Hagar is in Sarah's brain not God's. I want you to really think about what I just said. Hagar is in Sarah's brain, not God's brain. And Sarah has to get her brain renewed to see what God is seeing, to expect what God is expecting, and to also become shifted in where she has invested her energy. See, whatever you see in your brain, you invest your energy in it. It becomes a part of you mentally so much that even emotionally, you see that thing happening that you'll even pit your feelings and wrap it around that thing. And if it's not of God, it'll yield bitterness in the end. This is so profound what I'm telling you. This is so profound what I'm telling you. Always remember that God on purpose has hid a lot of the reality of the cups you'll drink. There's a reason why God does that. Let me always say this. Let, let me say this to you. God is aware of the fragile state of those that believe in him. God is aware that if you know every single thing that you will have to partake of, 
that there is a place in you where you will say it is easier. To pick Satan is easier. To choose flesh is easier. God is aware of the fragile state of man. God is aware of the fragile state of man. God knows that if you know every cup that you'll drink, you'll become more gullible to the serpent. If you take a note, remember this. Perseverance is the grace to keep going forward with God while he blindfolds you. Perseverance is the grace to keep going forward with God while he blindfolds you. See, you hear it in the word all the time. We walk by faith and not by what? Sight. Which means that walking with God requires blindfolders. He blindfolds you of who will become your enemy. That's why you never fight a man of God and say, if you're a man of God, how come you didn't know that person was going to be your enemy? No, 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 no. Never do that. Because whenever God is walking with any individual, he blindfolds them. He blindfolds them so that your, your, your increase and activate perseverance. Perseverance is a grace to keep going forward with God while he blindfolds you. Perseverance is also the ability to continue when God is not explaining himself. Perseverance is where God minimizes his teaching because he already taught you. And for you to persevere, it's your job to go back in time. See, backsliding is where you go back to your past to receive, retrieve information that the devil gave you. But the blessing is where you go back into your past to retrieve information that the Holy Ghost gave you. See, the blessing requires backspacing returning, revisiting. David revisited how the spirit of the Lord came upon him to destroy the bears for the sheep. And when he revisited that, he understood how to take down Goliath. John revisited what Jesus was telling him. That's why he was able to be at the cross with boldness. Because of his ability to revisit. Return. Backspace. See, God will have you backspace. Satan will have you backslide. But you notice that both backsliding and the blessing. Is you returning back to information. Information that comes from God. Blessing. Information that comes from the devil. Backsliding. Everything that you're doing in your present life. Is simply you going back in time. To find what you should do now. You're only tempted by. All the information. That you allowed to enter yourself in the past. That came from the devil. 
My goodness. My goodness. My goodness. Just think about it. Just think about it. Perseverance is where God minimizes his teaching because he already taught you. Perseverance is God placing a demand on his investment. Perseverance is God placing a demand on his investment. Perseverance is God placing a demand on his mentorship. He's looking to see, are you wasting my time? Are you wasting my assistance? Are you wasting my mercy? If you study the times of perseverance, Perseverance is packaging pressure. You feel the pressure. You feel like something is happening that never happened before. These are the guidelines to promotion. These are the guidelines to higher grace. These are the guidelines to divine favor. These are the guidelines to receiving your inheritance. Do you know that there is a segment that God has sanctified for everybody's life where he watches you persevere because he wants to see what is the exchange you're willing to make to receive what I promise you? What's the exchange? That's why you can't listen to these people that tell you, oh, we don't do nothing. It's already done. You don't listen to those fools because they'll have you broke, disgusted, busted, dusted, crusted. <laughs> they'll have you lost, hand tossed, <laughs> no dental flaws. Just remember. That God in the time of perseverance, he is studying what is the temperature that you're willing to go to receive what I promise you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they recognize that there is something that is happening to us that never happened. The king said, if you don't bow to this stature, you get thrown into the fire. They're under a rocky situation. It's hard. It's tough. It could easily make you exceedingly nervous. They could panic. If you take a note, remember that wisdom door, that panic is satanic. Panic is satanic. Panic is satanic. Satanic. Panic is satanic. Emotional imbalance. It is the side effect of prayerlessness. Emotional imbalance. Is the side effect of prayerlessness. When your soul is not being charged, Satan is at large. Do you know when criminals are at large? They can't even find them to arrest them. So when I say that, when, 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 when your soul is not charged, Satan is at large, you can't bind the devil. That's what bind means to arrest. You can't bind the devil, which means that you can't even stop the devil from sending pictures to your brain, affecting your mood, confusing you or what to do next. You can't stop the devil. The devil is at large. When your soul is not charged. Every day you started off at zero, which means that you have to pray in tongues. You have to seek God today because yesterday's seeking is not sufficient for today. Yesterday's seeking is not sufficient for now. You can't use the hunger that you had to eat from God yesterday, 
You have to develop a new hunger. Hunger, hunger, hunger will protect you from offense. Remember Matthew chapter five, they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. Hunger will protect you from offense. Hunger protects from offense. Hunger protects from offense. Thirst, it protects from weariness. Just think about that, thirst for righteousness. When you're thirsty for righteousness, which means that you are, you are anticipating with your whole heart to live out the will of God. Hunger and thirst for righteousness is anticipation to be blameless. Anticipation to be God's friend. God hides himself in fire. King Jesus hides himself in fire. Many people are looking for a move of the spirit. The moving of the spirit is not in peaceful times. The moving of the spirit is in injustice, in injustice. The moving of the spirit is in injustice. The moving of the spirit is in injustice. Did you hear me? The moving of the spirit. Just think about this. Jesus' greatest display of anointing wasn't healing the sick. Jesus' greatest display of anointing wasn't raising the dead. Jesus' greatest display of anointing was obedience to his cross. His greatest anointing wasn't multiplying the five loaves and two fish. His greatest display of anointing was submission to drink the cup for his life. That's why many people experience blessing. They still turn their back on God. So is the display of you being blessed the greatest display of your anointing? The greatest display of your anointing is where you bless the Lord. Not where the Lord blesses you. Right now, if God gave you $2 million, you will say, this is the biggest thing that have happened in my life. It's not. The biggest thing that could happen from your life is where you become that $2 million experience for the spirit of God. That is by your side. You see perspective. Gratefulness is not a scenery. Gratefulness is a perspective. Uh, a, a perspective. It's a perception. Gratefulness is not. Uh, your gratitude. Gratitude is not about a scenery. It's about a. Perception is about a perspective. It's about a divine opinion. So gratitude right now, if the Holy Spirit told me to live in a homeless shelter right now, I would go. It would hurt, but I would go. You know why? Because my gratitude is not a scenery. I like high ceilings. <laughs> I like to jump as high as I can and I still can't touch the top of my, 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 my place. I like high ceilings. 
I like space. <laughs> you know, I, I want to lift my hands like this. If I lift my hands both sides like this, I don't want them to, I don't want my fingers to, to, to bend on the wall. You see what I'm saying? I like nice things. I like smelling nice. But the Holy Spirit told me, hey, you, 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 you can't put on no cologne. You can't you take no showers for days. <laughs> that'll be hard. That'll, that'll be hard for me. Because I, I like being clean. I like being. I partake of nice things. I like nice things. I like doing my hair nice. But if the Holy Spirit told me you can't do your hair, you just gotta let you just gotta let it be as it is. It'll be a hard thing. Because I'm used to doing my hair for years. But I'm already prepared to give a yes. I'm hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Your hunger protects you from offense. Your thirst protects you from bitterness. Maturity protects you from jealousy. Love protects you from rebellion. Wisdom protects you from resisting God. Love protects you from rebellion. Love protects you from rebellion. Remember, that's why the word of God keeps saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. Love protects you from a rebellion. Maturity protects you from jealousy. The more mature you are, you'll recognize that it is not correct for you to look at somebody with an evil eye. That you must be grateful for your own specific and unique value. The word of God said that you'll procure your people. Let's read this. Mark chapter four. My intro turned into a wisdom door explosion. <laughs> That's the Holy Ghost wants you to hear all that stuff. Just think about it. The Holy Spirit wants you to hear all those things. I'm going to talk to you in here about this. Let's go to uh, Mark chapter four. Let's look right here. Mark chapter four says this in verse 14. It says, the sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately. And take it away the word that was sown in their hearts. Wait, the Bible said that Satan cometh immediately and take it away the word that was sown in the, to their hearts. It's talking about the wayside. Watch this. Look at this. Verse 16. Says, and these are they that likewise, which are sown on stony ground. It says that when they have heard the word, immediately they receive it with gladness. I want you to highlight that. Receive it with gladness, which means you're inspired. That's why I told you that inspiration is also deceptive. Inspiration is not deliverance. Inspiration is God jump starting you. It doesn't mean that you're driving full gear on the road. Inspiration is deceptive. When inspiration goes, you appear. When inspiration goes, it exposes your goals. What you're aiming at. What is your real priority? When inspiration goes. Look at, look at what the Bible says. They immediately receive it with gladness. Look at verse 17. And have no root in themselves. Wow. 
so you can be inspired and you're not even rooted in Christ, which means that you're not loyal or committed. You could be inspired and not changed. You sense the inspiration, but your heart is still in the same condition. Wow. That's very, very notable. Look what it says. And they have no root in themselves. And so they endure before a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Wait, I got to read this again. I got to read this again. Oh, I got to read this again. Let's, let's look at this here. It says they have no root in themselves, so they endure before a time. Afterward, when affliction, you know what affliction is all about? Mistreatment. It could be sickness in your body, disease in your body. Affliction could be many different things. It could be losing your job. Affliction could be being pit out by somebody. Affliction could be going to jail. Affliction could be some type of hardship manifested against you. When you're afflicted, that means that your body, your mind is encountering hellish times your emotions, your soul. Look what it says. Afterward, when affliction, now watch this here, affliction or persecution. So affliction and persecution are different. Affliction is you going through a lot of stuff. You can feel it in your body. You can feel it in your mind. You can feel it in your conditions, your atmosphere. But persecution is where people rise up against you and they talk to you with threats, they talk to you with bad news, they talk to you with negativity, they talk to you to impart fear, fret, uncert uncertainty, doubt, unbelief. They persecute you. They make you second guess God's voice. His path. Perse what is the purpose of persecution? Satan created persecution to convince people that God did not say that. It started off in Genesis. The purpose of persecution is don't invest your trust in what you thought God said. Change. Repent from God's word. Persecution is satanic repentance. That's the purpose of persecution is satanic repentance. Repent from the word of the Lord. Don't go forth. You notice Elijah, when he encountered persecution, he prayed to die, which means he prayed to repent against the word of the Lord. He didn't want to do the word of the Lord no more. So you understand that persecution is a heavy missile of attack from the devil that exposes to you whether or not, or whether or not you have governed yourself properly with God's investment. If you have been taking him serious, because when persecution come, it, it, it is on purpose going to magnify your heart. The man came up to Jesus, walked away grievously. This is why Satan sends persecution. So that Jesus will become a grievous experience for you. And remember, I told you gratitude is about perception, not scenery. 
So it doesn't matter the scenery you in. If you have gratitude, you'll be thankful. If you have gratitude, you'll be thankful. Gratitude is not about the scenery, it's about the perception, the perspective, the opinion. So no matter the environment or what's happening to you, if you're grateful, that cannot be touched or accessed by your conditions. Let me show you something. So when Satan uses, so what, what, what Jesus is doing here in the text of the disciples is revealing to them the two ways that Satan is going to attempt to take them out of the straight and narrow path. Satan is going to use affliction. So think it not strange when you go through affliction. Like I told you, it could be bodily affliction, mental affliction, conditional affliction, workplace affliction, financial affliction. It says when affliction or persecution ariseth, for what? The word's sake. I, let's slow this down. So if you didn't receive the word of the Lord, you would never encounter the affliction or the persecution. And that's what I've been teaching you, satanic peace, which Satan gives to people that reject the word of the Lord for their life. It's like a life with Satan saying, hey, you ain't got to worry about nobody calling you stupid. You ain't got to worry about nobody uh, 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 saying you deceive, you're brainwashed. You ain't got to worry about nobody calling your names. But, but, but at the end of your life, you end up in a place where you get called names. Where demons disrespect you and you can't call on Jesus. You can't release no blood. You can't release no covenant. They have full authority. You are their slaves for all eternity. So Satan promises people peace if they get away from Jesus. All for the peace to become chaos, eternal damnation, eternal torment in the end. Orpah didn't want the drama of Naomi. But could Orpah see her eternity? Ruth. Embrace the drama of Naomi. Because in the drama of Naomi was the presence of God. King Jesus is not in pleasures. King Jesus is in storms. The disciples hopped and rejoiced when they saw limbs grow back. They hopped and rejoice when they saw the dead rise again. But they begin to criticize Jesus when the winds and the waves started blowing in the boat. Not knowing that the only way they could know him is not in the miracles. You know Jesus in the miseries. That's why I glory in persecutions. I glory in betrayals. I glory in hardships. I glory in bad reports. I glory in storms. Because this is where the greater grace is. If you want to know who Jesus is, you're not going to find him in the comforts of life. You're going to find him in the pains of life. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. 
this suffering of this present time is producing a glory. It's the sufferings of this present time. Many people run from the sufferings of this present time. This is where you get to know who Jesus is. That's why believers, they go to the doctor, they hear they got some type of disease, some type of sickness, and they want to faint. Why would you let this happen to me? And Jesus is saying, I thought you said you wanted me. This is where I'm at. This is where you get to know who I am. This is where you get to experience my true person. The woman with the two mites, she's having financial problems. She don't got enough money. Things are looking hard for her. She decides I'm going to sow. My two mites, I'm going to give. And Jesus starts to gossip about the woman. You see this woman? She has given more than everybody in here that's given out their abundance. What is Jesus doing? He's captivated. He's captured because she's embracing the place where he hides. He hides in sacrificial giving. He hides. When your life is on the line and you still trust him. Jesus hides. When it looks like everything else is about to fail. And you say, blessed be the name of the Lord. 